Welcome to the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight webcast series. Today's conference will start in a moment. The WFS is dedicated to educating technology leaders through webcasts like these and the Growth and Exit Strategies conference series held in London, New York, Silicon Valley, and other tech and financial centers around the world. The speakers and sponsors of these live events read like a who's who of industry leaders. To learn more about our live events for CEOs, owners, and investors, or to access our library of on-demand spotlight webcasts, covering markets like IT security, health tech, gaming, and more, please visit WFS.com. And now, let's join today's Market Spotlight webcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight. My name is Rob Schramm, Senior Vice President at Corm Group. I'm joined by my colleague, Joel Espelin, also a Vice President and Dealmaker with Corm. And we're delighted to bring you today's webcast focusing on the disruptive trend of smart logistics. Here's what we'll be covering in the next 30 minutes. I'll begin with some opening remarks to frame our discussion and then hand off to Joel, who will deliver the sector report, highlighting uh, key metrics and ind ind indicative deals shaping the space. Then uh, Joel will conduct a panel discussion, uh, providing insightful industry perspective from uh, some experts, Brian Wydell, Oren Zaslansky, and Aaron Collins. Then we'll wrap up with some closing thoughts. Before we get to the research report, though, here are some introductory thoughts on the broader topic. Logistics is a huge part of the world economy, more than $8 trillion globally, and that number is expected to nearly double in the next five years, topping $15 trillion by 2023. This industry is responsible for getting goods and services from those that produce them, suppliers and manufacturers, to those that sell them, retailers and businesses, to those that consume them, consumers and businesses. And we're talking about a lot of stuff. More than 60 billion tons of cargo moved last year alone. At the same time, in lockstep with the evolving technologies, both consumer and business customers are becoming much more demanding. Businesses no longer want to hold large inventories, and consumers want their e-commerce shipments delivered just in time as well, immediately, if not sooner. All of this means that logistics providers everywhere are being asked to do their jobs better, faster, and cheaper than ever before. The only way this can happen is through the massive application of new technology, also known as smart logistics. The tech encompasses data-driven software platforms that automate the management of shipping and storage, fleet management, supply chain management, and much more. Key inputs to these systems come increasingly from connected sensors and vehicles that use IoT or GPS-enabled telematics platforms to track the exact whereabouts of goods, asset drivers, and field service workers of all kinds. Of course, given the massive volume of data that logistics represents in real time, there's plenty of need for big data analytics, which these days increasingly means machine learning and even artificial intelligence. We've seen a host of recent deals in this space with an extremely diverse set of buyers. Mobile operators, retail giants, internet giants, GPS companies, non-tech buyers from the industrial world, and of course the private equity funds are all buying for their share of the smart logistics pie. We'll hear more about some of these deals from Joel in a moment, but it's worth emphasizing that we're witnessing a massive, in fact disruptive, shift in the way our economy delivers goods to market. Next, we're going to examine the implications of this trend for companies like yours and like those represented on the call today, innovative technology companies that are both impacting and being impacted by this trend. To dive into some of what we're seeing, I'd like to turn things over now to my colleague, Joel Espin. Thanks, Rob, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And as is appropriate for a market spotlight on smart logistics, we're going to move quickly through these topics. We do have a great panel for you, and I want to make sure we reserve as much time for that. So we'll move quickly, but if you've got questions about these deals, feel free to uh, reach out to uh, Rob or myself, and we'd be happy to go into more detail. So as Rob mentioned, we're just seeing uh, an incredible convergence of M&A activity around the smart logistics space. Uh, obviously, this sea of logos just gives you an idea. Uh, I think this is maybe the most diverse space uh, in the entire economy in terms of the number of different M&A players who are extremely active. As Rob mentioned, everything from technology folks, logistics folks, traditional industrials, international companies. So we're going to see that 
as we go through and look both at the patterns as well as some individual deals. So who are the top buyers in this category? Uh, over the past three years as this trend has really gotten underway. You see some interesting names on this slide. Leading the pack is Australian uh, company WiseTech that has really made a name for itself in cloud logistics and is essentially uh, attempting to execute what we would classically uh, deem a roll-up uh, of smaller companies in the space. Definitely a company to watch and also an indication of just how global the smart logistics category is. The cart, uh, French player, obviously a number two, uh, equally uh, indicative of that trend. Within the supply chain space, I think what's important to note is folks on the call, competition from that space, is we're really seeing a convergence between, between traditional supply chain and the rest of the smart logistics ecosystem. So in our view, uh, those silos are breaking down and you're starting to see players uh, play across the space uh, as we would uh, classically deem it, buying into adjacent markets. So again, folks like Descartes and WiseTech playing there, as well as uh, folks who wouldn't necessarily traditionally thought of a supply chain company like a Trimble, which obviously comes from the navigation space. In terms of financial buyers, uh, we're seeing some of our, our usual suspects, certainly Vista Equity for folks who follow Quorum closely know uh, our, our top financial buyer last year, also very active in this space, uh, but Inside Venture Partners actually taking the top spot uh, over the past couple of years in terms of um, um, deals that they've completed, but we see a lot of other private equity folks active in this space. Um, although the majority of deals, as you see in the pie chart, uh, are represented by strategic buyers. But what have we seen in terms of deal flow? Obviously, there was a huge wave uh, in early 2015 as kind of the, the, the first generation of smart logistics deals happened. And remember, as we've reported also in our more um, our regular monthly and quarterly webinars, overall deal volume has been down slightly uh, due to the supply constraint of just not enough deals out there. So against that backdrop, we actually see uh, uh, very strong volumes with deal volume actually up in uh, the second half of last year to 58 total deals. The other thing to note here at the top of this slide is that median deal size number that folks are chasing uh, larger and larger deals here, obviously not just driving up valuation, but obviously also as companies mature in this space, you're seeing that deal size go up. In terms of geographical locations, the, the U.S. and Americas have really been out in front on this issue. I think the nature of the U.S. economy, in terms of the complexity of our value chain, obviously the size of the U.S., uh, and the uh, need for logistics we have here, and obviously our single big market, all leads to the U.S. being in a strong position here. Uh, but I wouldn't sleep on Asia. There are things, uh, big things happening there, and we're going to talk about a few of those uh, in, in just a moment. So in terms of valuations, remember what I said earlier about convergence between supply chain and the rest of the logistics space. Traditionally, what you tended to see were supply chain companies trading at a premium to the rest of logistics, some of which uh, was a little more commoditized. But as the rest of the sector becomes smarter, by right, smarter warehouse, smarter transport, smarter asset management, we're really seeing a convergence in valuations, which is exactly what you see, uh, both in terms of sales multiple as well as EBITDA. And I think we would expect that to continue. So the other thing we would point out is that this isn't just one market. They're really are sectors within this market that folks on the call need to think about, whether you're on the sell side or on the buy side. Uh, down at the left side of this chart, obviously there's uh, smart logistics companies which really come out of an IT services background, and those trade much like IT services. Uh, in that middle group, the one to three X sales multiples, you're really seeing what we would call legacy companies coming out of supply chain and logistics, traditional enterprise site license type business model. In the next group is what, what you would think of as uh, supply chain staff companies, right? folks who are now delivering cloud logistics. Again, think of the kind of companies WiseTech is buying. And then on the far right, obviously, is what we would consider true next-gen technology. Uh, again, uh, potentially implicating some of our other top 10 trends, things like AI and the other uh, uh, best of breed technologies coming into this space. So let's get to some deals. 
and there are a number of, of fascinating ones. Um, first deal uh, that we'd like to mention was the acquisition uh, of MacroPoint by Descartes. Uh, so this is a uh, load tracking and management SaaS product. We're going to hear a lot about that space during our panel discussion. Um, but suffice to say here, lots of innovation happening in the shipping and, and freight sector, again, particularly in the U.S., and this feels completely indicative of that. The second deal that we'd like to highlight here was Pitney Bowes' acquisition of Nugistics. And obviously, folks know Pitney Bowes originally strong in the SMB uh, sort of mailing uh, and packaging space, but they've really uh, expanded their offerings and picked up Nugistics in order to help them capitalize on the explosive growth in e-commerce, which obviously is not primarily letters, it's packages and parcels, right? So, so that's Pitney Bowes essentially moving into both logistics and e-commerce with the logistics play uh, coming from the SMB side. Third deal was Walmart's acquisition of Parcel uh, last fall. Parcel, again, essentially a last mile uh, delivery company focusing um, on uh, urban areas in both the perishable and non-perishable categories. And this shows just how important last mile delivery has come, but also reveals the trend of large retailers vertically integrating logistics capabilities and not being content to rely on outside vendors, but wanting to own that full stack capability. Um, and we're definitely seeing much more of that. An additional player that Rob mentioned at the top were the telcos and mobile operators. And obviously Verizon is represented here. Folks know their fleet Matic deal a couple uh, years ago in the fleet management space. Um, but also you should think about Skyward, which really is a drone management platform. And so uh, if you want to choose last mile, right, last kilometer, um, if you will, that as folks start to move uh, drones into the commercial space, um, Folks like Verizon may not be managing uh, that package delivery, but they may absolutely help deliver, providing the infrastructure that manages those drones. We think that's why they picked up Skyward. Another retail uh, technology play uh, that folks may have heard about was Target's acquisition of Grand Junction uh, last summer for $90 million. Another same day in local delivery. So we see the theme, again, we've often termed uh, this trend, the reverse Amazon effect, where uh, Amazon's obviously pushed into local delivery, same day of delivery, is causing retailers to react, um, which is cascading all the way through the M&A ecosystem. Uh, second deal from Target was their acquisition of SHIP for over a half a billion uh, last December. Um, SHIP is really in the mobile grocery space, so uh, I think, again, folks need to be aware, I think roughly nearly 40% of Target's revenue uh, these days uh, is now grocery uh, and, and closely related categories. So it's absolutely critical for folks like Target to be able to uh, not only manage in-store, but that omni-channel, or as we call it, composite commerce grocery experience, and that's why they picked up SHIP. Uh, our first Chinese deal, uh, we have Alibaba picking up uh, Kainyo, uh Smart Logistics Network in China for uh, over $800 million. Um, and again, this is Alibaba, obviously traditionally a marketplace uh, in, in e-commerce in China, but another example of e-commerce companies wanting to go full stack um, and uh, vertically integrate into smart logistics. We think this is true not just in China, but elsewhere. And also on a global scene, clearly Alibaba is a force to watch at the level of Amazon and Walmart in terms of their ability to impact the entire smart logistics space on a global scale. Another fascinating deal for us was the acquisition uh, of Radial by B Post. Obviously, this is a traditional uh, postal service, uh, buying a technology company for, for significant dollars. And again, uh, the same notion of e-commerce, not just of uh, traditional communications and letters, but doing order management, fulfill fulfillment, as well as shipping and logistics services on behalf of other parties, right? So that's the fundamental choice. Are you going to do those services yourself or are you going to outsource them to a third party? This uh, B-Post is really trying to be an outsource provider. 
And our last deal, truly hot off the presses, uh, this deal uh, printed, as you say, on April 23rd uh, of 2018, $2 billion investment by uh, a syndicate led by SoftBank and Alphabet, a.k.a. Google, into um, Chinese firm Manbang Group, which is a, uh, a truck calling app by which uh, in the U.S. we would think of that as the LPL or less than a uh, truckload market, um, turning that into a giant marketplace in China. But again, $2 billion investment um, by SoftBank and Alphabet into China's largest, if you will, truck sharing service. So just, just a sense of how, how dynamic and, uh, and disruptive the change that we're seeing coming in this space. So with that, I'm going to try to get to our panel, make sure they've got uh, as much time as possible uh, again, to provide a brief intro, you're really going to enjoy uh, these three gentlemen. We have Brian Waddell, founder and CEO of Envio 360. They're in the intermodal transport software space. Uh, Oren Zaslansky, founder and CEO of Optics, which is uh, innovating in the LPL space, as I mentioned earlier. And Eric Collins, founder and CEO of Connected Holdings, uh, which is an extremely innovative company in the IoT for smart logistics space, innovating particularly in the truck and trailer and connected cargo space. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, kick it off. And our first question we're going to provide to each of the panelists is just a question of what are you seeing out in the space and help describe some of the innovations um, that are coming and the problems folks are trying to solve. And I'm going to start today with Warren. So in my world, I kind of live in the middle of how is technology, particularly hyperscaling technology, coming in and attempting to fundamentally change the rules of the game. So I kind of live between two worlds. One is the less than truckload world, which is quintessentially a hub and spoke. It's basically a 100-year-old innovation. It's become, I would argue, as optimal and as efficient as it can, given we're talking about trucks and forklifts and, and labor. And then the other side is on the full truckload world, which is actually relatively efficient, but my belief is, is one of the big pain points right now is on kind of everything from telemetry and visibility to the ability to access what is an extremely fragmented market of the independent owner operator. So the customers that we're talking to and the partners, there's this tension of there's got to be a better way. You know, we've been doing something for 100 years. How can technology change it? Damage rates are too high. Things are too slow. There's a lack of transparency, lack of visibility. And all that comes together into an environment that feels almost intentionally obfuscated. There's really not a, a visible marketplace whereby we know that there is a truck to meet the need for the, for the load. But it's getting those two things together in the, in the right place right time and in a really efficient manner, in a very scalable manner using technology that isn't really quite there yet, although there's a lot of people who are, who are going after it. No, oh, that's great, Oren. It really sets the table extremely well. I want to jump to Eric, because really what you're providing, Eric, quickly focused on the cargo sensor space and generally in the trailer tracking spaces, both those two is enabling technology. What are you hearing from your partners and customers? What problems are those technologies trying to solve? You know, I think the instrumentation of trailers and containers and chassis, we launched this electronic logging device solution into the owner-operator part of the over-the-road trucking world, which a lot of people don't understand. We two-thirds of the semi-trackers on the roads are run by owner-operators, and they're, they're really cowboys. They're, they're not organized at all. They don't want tracking devices in their trackers. They want to keep doing things the way they've been doing, you know, for 100 years. And technology, you know, hasn't been deployed very much, partly because of that resistance, but also because there hasn't been good standards and nobody's really focused on trying to get the cost out of the hardware and, and really selling an optimized solution. So we work with this company called truckstop.com up in Idaho, which has an online marketplace that a, a large percentage of the owner-operators use to shop for their business every day in the, in the form of truckloads. Basically, none of the trailers have instrumentation on them, and, and none of the tractors do either. Today, there's brokers on both sides of the freight choosing process. Even though there's an, an electronic online marketplace, the people that 
They're actually the customers in the form of the truck drivers, and they don't themselves use the online marketplace. So there's brokers on both sides of that still. And as with every other opportunity for Internet of Things kind of services technologies, you know, we're really lowering the overall cost and increasing the efficiency. And much of that cost lowering is coming from automating out the manual brokering process. A lot of, a lot of the reason to use this stuff is that people are losing their assets. It's amazing how large scale organizations have no idea where their shipping containers are or their chassis or their trailers. Right. Both of you, I think, have essentially talked about making this opaque market ultimately transparent. Maybe for folks who aren't familiar with it, maybe just another minute more. Eric, uh, can you explain you, what you were talking about earlier in terms of what what an ultrasonic cargo sensor does? Ultrasonic cargo sensors use sound waves, much like radar. So we've got a sensor that you can mount on one end of a semi-trailer, and it can look full trip 53 feet and be able to tell you reliably if there's freight in that space or not. Those sensors we're connecting up to our cellular you know, GPS tracking devices, that also monitor a pretty big variety of additional sensors and tire pressure and all the different kinds of maintenance things that can go wrong with the trailer. We're, we're automating the monitoring of that and drive a non-predictive maintenance, crisis-driven maintenance scenario into a totally predictive maintenance, which also has a huge cost savings for anybody in, this, in the business of moving freight. No, thanks for that. Let's go over to you, Brian. You know, we're talking about certainly efficiency and, and trying to kind of move legacy, fragmented, maybe even paper-based markets into something more efficient. Talk to you about, talk to us about the problems you're seeing and, you know, what, what problems you've been working on. Sure. So, first off, I definitely want to put a third star next to what Eric and Orrin have been saying about uh, the significance of the contractors and the, and the tracking. Within Intermodal, the situation is actually that the motor carrier who is responsible for moving the goods by truck and nominally to provide visibility into what's going on with that movement uh, very frequently owns none of the moving equipment assets involved. So they don't own the container uh, that the goods are loaded in. Uh, the chassis, which is the frame and wheels that the container gets mount, mounted on to be moved by truck, and as the other panelists have alluded to, owner-operators are very often the driver, and what that owner-operator is owning is, is the truck. So, you know, oftentimes there's not a consistency about exactly what technology is installed in those particular vehicles. So for a motor carrier and for the you know, greater supply chain community that's trying to plan and get visibility into the execution of these intermodal movements, getting data out of the field and getting it in a way that has consistency and reliability is a huge challenge. So that is certainly something that uh, Envio is tackling head on. We see our intermodal optimization platform as a twofold mission, one to get and distribute the necessary information and also to make use of it from an efficiency standpoint in terms of planning and executing efficient drainage moves in real time. Oh, that's great. That's great insight. Let's talk about solutions in terms of where things are going, hopefully with some, uh, some optimistic hope that we can help solve some of these thorny challenges. Oren, I know your company's in stealth mode, but at least talk to us at a high level of where do you see your space going over the next several years? Yeah, that's literally the billion-dollar question. There's most activity right now from a technology perspective in, in terms of the circle that I'm running in is occurring in the full truck load space, and then the SaaS providers that are also kind of focused on enabling the full truck load space. And, and so what I mean by that is there are many Uber for freight type models out there now, um, including literally Uber in the freight space, Convoy, Transfix, several others. The hope and the aim, as best I can tell, is to put an app in the hand of an independent owner operator, of which there's something like a million and a half of them in the United States, and connect them as supply with demand. I'm not sure how that's going to play out. I'm personally a little bit bearish on it being a massive game changer to the economics of it. The reason is that there are, you know, somebody mentioned on the line earlier, like truckstop.com, there's DAT. There, there, there are several marketplaces. We don't call them that. We call them load boards, but they're kind of like eBay for freight. They're already there. There's not a lot of technology that's necessarily driving those, so certainly everything can be optimized. 
but it's unclear to me how an app in the hand of a truck driver is truly a fundamental game changer at the unit economic level. That being said, the landscape is fluid, to say the least. There, there's a lot of new entrants into the market and a lot of drive toward innovation. I am very bullish on the idea that the landscape will, will shift significantly. Where I think it becomes really interesting is with the ELD folks out there who, for the first time ever, due to you know regulatory requirement, we're going to start to be able to see where the truck driver is. When, in my mind, ELDs become incredibly interesting in the location data, and if we can figure out how to not only discover where the driver is, but if really we can look into the future and we can see where they're going, are they full or partially full? Are they shipping air coupled with... The fast guys like a Four Kites or a Project 44 and how all those things coalesce, that I think has tremendous potential to redefine the landscape because now we're talking about really the bread and butter of the full truckload community, the 80% of freight that's being moved long haul in this country, being able to have automated and scalable access to where that supply is. If I'm new school using technology to change the way transportation flows, certainly we'd love it. But old school is going to love it, too, whether it's a C.H. Robbins or an XPO. I mean, I think everybody stands to benefit from this, including that owner operator. It's a chance for them to, to run more miles, run more efficient miles, be fuller, be loaded more often, decrease deadhead and, and backhaul. I don't know that there's one silver bullet. In my mind, it's how they all come together. That's going to be really transformative. No, oh, great stuff, Warren. Building on that, and I'll go back to you, Brian, and we'll finish with Eric. Where do you hope things will be three to five years out once we're able to you know, solve some of those basic enabling issues? What kind of solutions are we going to be able to build in the uh, intermodal space? So definitely a real transformation in what role the human dispatcher currently plays in the process versus what that role looks like three to five years out. It's going to be much more collaborative process with AI and optimization automation, handling the bulk of the routine decision making and doing so with a much richer and fuller comprehension of the real time information flows that Eric references. We do start to get real time ELD feeds, both in terms of position and hours available and the traffic aware feeds now and the analytics coming out of the terminals in terms of turns times and how that compares with norms and averages. You know, a dispatcher is a very talented role in, a, in an intermodal trucking company because they do their best to take as much of this information into account and largely through their experience, you know, risk adjust for, you know, the things that can go off track. And so they, they know where in the plan to kind of build in buffers for that to happen. But what the optimization and automation can do is still build those kind of risk buffers in, but also make much more comprehensive and immediate reactions when things do start to change than even the best human dispatcher can do. And so what's the role then of the dispatcher? Well, there's still a very important relationship with the driver in terms of when a driver actually does have a problem in the field, whether that's customer-induced or equipment-induced, helping them through that issue, et cetera, and when there's customer outreach necessary, getting in contact with the customer. So there is roles that essentially only humans can play there, but the computer's going to help do a lot of uh, that routine heavy lifting and find that extra half a move, half a turn, as we call it in the industry, that would represent anything from a 5 to 20% efficiency gain. So we're going to see more automation. We're going to see more uh, and better visibility, and we're going to see better planning as these changes play out. And it's a great summary, Brian. I mean, we see that across many segments where, you know, human plus AI, the role of the human changes as algorithms start to play a bigger role in, in helping to drive those efficiencies. But the one thing we always talk about, Eric, is that, you know, AIs need data. So maybe let's talk numbers for a second, put you on the spot a little bit, you know, three years out, five years out. How many containers and, and trucks and the like do you think we can connect? How many connected trucks will be out there? One of the things that's really interesting about this market is the, the level that it's been penetrated so far is quite small. There's a bit over 3 million trackers in the United States, and a little bit over a million of them are in fleets big enough that they invested in fleet management equipment. So all your big fleet management companies, including the three that Verizon spent $4 billion on, is still less than a third of the total available market just for tracking the, the trackers. The dry trailer market is about 
12% penetrated with tracking devices at this point. The shipping container market is, is quite a lot less than that. And the chassis the shipping containers get set on is, is also quite low. Start adding up all those numbers just in terms of devices and services to, to track those devices. It's, that's a, a very large market. Semi-trailers, there's about 8 million of those on the, on the road. There's about 200,000 new ones being built every year. They have about a 10-year life. You know, all that stuff needs to be instrumented for us to really be effective in changing the economics of everything that we were talking about. Another technology that hasn't been brought up yet that I think is, is fundamentally important here is blockchain. You know, all this AI stuff that we can do is sort of a helter-skelter gather data, see if we can find patterns in it is going to be totally brought to order by the implementation of blockchain into the transportation process. And uh, we've now become active in a standard setting body called uh, blockchain and transportation that I think is going to set a standard for how do we do these parallel ledgers. How do we have the devices in the trailers and in the tractors going through geofences and going through different steps? And I think it actually applies right out into the brokering world. So I think once this blockchain infrastructure is, is standardized and deployed, it'll not only get used for optimizing the freight movement, it'll get used for optimizing the, the choice of carriers at the sort of marketplace level, online marketplace level. You know, don't know, you know how that's all going to happen, but it's clear that it is going to happen. And we're, we're right now implementing the core, you know, the base functionality that it takes to put that in our devices and let that drive the ledgering system. I think it's going to be the biggest opportunity in the next five years in the IoT world, Joel. Oh, great comments, Eric. I mean, just by way of interest on that, I've also been intrigued in the standard setting world. Maybe it's a little, you know, farther out, whether it's five, ten years or more. But by the physical internet movement, Pi, as it's called, I think is also, you know, intriguing over the longer run in terms of uh, trying to set standards for movement of smaller than container size objects through our, our physical logistics network. I'll kind of phrase the last question this way is, obviously we see a lot of interesting, uh, call it industry reorganization, whether it's uh, horizontal integration, vertical integration, but in a market where you see you know, folks like Amazon and Walmart and what they may try to do from a vertical integration perspective in the sense of trying to, to own certain parts of a, a logistics chain, large horizontals like telcos, where do you think the large traditional branded guys like FedEx and UPS? I'll just open it up to you guys. You know, any thoughts on how you see the industry changing and in particularly in terms of things that might disrupt the status quo in the industry? Oren, you want to take first crack at that? Uh, sure. I think we're in a really interesting inflection point of the space in that there's people like Amazon who, you know, have built these incredible marketplaces who are now building what, in my opinion, is going to become the largest logistics and actual transportation company in the world going down the value chain. And I don't mean that pejoratively, but right. just, you know, kind of having been a, a large tech platform and now saying, no, we want boots on the ground. Coupled with companies like XPO and CH Robinson that have always done acquisitions, I think we're only going to see that accelerate due to the kind of the tumultuous concerns that Amazon and, and the ripple that they're putting through the markets are going to have. But what really, I think, makes this a, a different time for the space is uh, the amount of venture capital that's starting to flow in and the, and the appetites and the expectations that these large value funds have for significant exits, whether it be in the IPO market or in, in terms of an acquisition. And I think, one guy's opinion, we're going to see some very unusual buyers emerge. With before, the, the quintessential exit might be to, you know, Coyote selling to a UPS, and that, that's a fantastic outcome, or Echo Global Logistics going public. I think what we're going to see now is people like Uber and Amazon and Google and, and maybe Apple and, and untold others making acquisitions in the space that probably won't look like they make a ton of sense initially and then may prove out to never make sense or may be quite unusual and unorthodox, but they unlock a lot of value. And then kind of the virtuous cycle that that creates that if I'm a, like, we'll just say XPO, what does that mean to them if they see the types of resources of a Google coming in and deploying capital? Capital. What does that mean to an XPO from an M&A fund for them? I think all these things are actually coalescing simultaneously. So I do think it's a super fascinating, interesting time to, to be in this space. Great stuff, Warren. From your side, Eric, you mentioned Verizon earlier and what they're doing. 
Where do you see additional opportunities for mobile operators as well as some of the big tech platforms in the things that you're seeing? I agree. Everybody's going to get interested in this. I'm hoping that some number of us small companies get to become really big companies at, at the end of this transition. I think another Amazon or Google kind of company is going to come into existence out of the collection of Internet of Things opportunities. But in the transportation world, if you look at how a lot of that has distilled over the years, somebody will surface and from good investment practices will end up rolling up a lot of this stuff at the end of the day. But I think there's going to be a lot of M&A activity at all levels, and it's going to be, it's going to be fun to participate in and watch. Brian, I'll let you jump in here as well. Uh, the other category we haven't even mentioned yet is all the traditional enterprise and integrator guys, all who have large logistics as well as obviously AI practices, everybody from Oracle, SAP, IBM, but certainly traditional folks like Accenture and the, the managed folks coming from that side as well, who might be the, the surprising actors in the space as you see it, Brian. Well, I definitely think that the question of whether non-traditional buyers really start to get involved in what I would call the, the AI arms race, you know, whether they allow that to be permanently and ultimately outsourced to technology vendors or if they see those sorts of things as something that they want to be proprietary and competitive differentiators of their own business as you know, a retailer, as a shipper, as a freight transportation provider. And I think that's going to have a very interesting effect on whether you tend to see consolidation and roll-up of these technologies into a couple of leading technology vendors that serve all of those types of companies as consumers, or if the consumers themselves, the you know the Amazons of the world, et cetera, want to have this stuff be proprietary, then essentially you're going to have a continuous need for more and more startups to feed that acquisition hunger so that more and more of these companies can arm themselves with that technology. So I don't know which way that's going to go, but I think it'll be very interesting to watch that play out. The other thing I would say in the trucking software and technology segment of the industry, what's been called a transportation management system, has operated a multi-page long checklist of 100 different things, 100 is being conservative, that a TMS is supposed to do and do well in that segment of the industry in order for it to be valid. Certainly there's still going to be roles for TMS, but I think its scope of functionality is going to be such that no TMS is going to do everything, and so you're going to have the emergence of platforms and ecosystems around those platforms where best-of-breed providers of certain functionalities provide, still within the vertical, but basically horizontally across that vertical to many different types of consumers. The integrations and touch points between those different best-of-breed vendors being important and seamless as attributes of a good technology vendor rather than one vendor being expected to do everything. So. Right. That eternal tug of war between best-of-breed and platform, I think you absolutely nailed it, Brian. We're going to see a lot more of that dynamic going forward. The other two things I would offer up for your consideration, guys, when we think about the larger ecosystem is, one, remember logistics is a global space, right? Certainly we've been focused on the U.S., but we all know this is a global space. You know, there's Asian participants as well as certainly Europeans. We see folks like WiseTech, Descartes, as well as uh, even Chinese folks like Alibaba that may be heard from here. And then the second thing that we certainly see every day is the tremendous influx of private equity as kind of a new source people building platform companies with bolt-on acquisitions and almost functioning like a kind of conglomerate around certain verticals. And we certainly see logistics to be one of those categories where they're trying to build, you know, kind of franchises that can potentially compete with the big boys. So lots of opportunity. And I hope you all have found this interesting. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I really want to thank you all for participating today, uh, for your excellent dialogue. Hopefully uh, you learned something I certainly did. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Joel, Brian, Oren, and Eric. Just terrific insight into the logistics and supply chain road ahead. Uh, Multidimensional, broadly inclusive technology set, uh, market inflection points on the horizon coming up fast. <laughs> Very exciting. Well, let's move now to some closing thoughts. Uh, first uh, point is, uh, go ahead and bring that up. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. If you've tuned into Quorum's Tech M&A Monthlies, you know that there's an unprecedented amount of cash uh, driving a very active global M&A market. The smart logistics sector is one of the hottest with loads of opportunities for smarter companies to participate. Uh, next, buyers are everywhere, and thanks in part to trends like smart logistics, it's a flatter world every day. Uh, it's a complex buyer community, so uh, be in traffic, uh, building relationships across the expanding smart logistics ecoverse. Uh, this means forming alliances with companies that may become buyers, build relationships with internal partner sponsors or champions who can endorse uh, both your commercial and acquisition aspirations and opportunities. Um, and uh, the investment dollars will drive and consolidate this market. Uh, if uh, PEs will help you up the curve, uh, competitors that are backed by massive amounts of PE uh, cash and investments may significantly raise the bar. So uh, lastly, keep an eye on the market. Now may be an excellent time to calibrate and partner up with a buyer that has the resources that you need. Well, that's it for our session today. I want to thank our panel and Joel and you, our guests, for joining us. Uh, as mentioned uh, uh, previously, if you have questions or you want a copy of today's presentations, you can find us at uh, WFS.com or contact Joel or myself. We look forward to seeing you at our next World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight. Thanks again. We hope you enjoy today's online symposium. If you have any questions not answered, please submit them to info at WFS.com. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming live events in a city near you. To register for these live events, view upcoming webcast topics, or hear rebroadcast of this or other market spotlight events, please go to WFS.com. Thank you for attending today's webcast.